Welcome back. I'm astronomer and author Jeffrey Bennett, and this is the second video in the Eclipse set I've produced on behalf of Big Kids Science and Storytime from Space. The first video introduced the Great American Eclipse of August 21st, 2017. Here, I'll discuss more generally the questions of how and why eclipses occur. There are two basic types of eclipse. A solar eclipse, like the one of August 21st, 2017, occurs when the moon comes between Earth and the sun, so that the moon's shadow falls on Earth. If you are lucky enough to witness a total solar eclipse, you'll see the moon gradually block more and more of the sun, and for up to a few minutes it will completely cover the sun's visible surface, allowing you to see the faint light of the sun's outer atmosphere, or corona. The second basic type of eclipse is a lunar eclipse, in which Earth comes between the moon and the sun, so that Earth's shadow falls on the moon. This series of photos shows Earth's shadow gradually covering more and more of the Moon during a total lunar eclipse, with totality at the far right. Notice that Earth's shadow is clearly curved, a fact that enabled ancient scholars, including Aristotle, to recognize that our world is round nearly 2,000 years before Columbus ever set sail. Also notice that the Moon takes on a red tinge during totality, created by the reflective glow of all the sunrises and sunsets that ring our planet at that time. These diagrams also show you why you are much more likely to see a lunar eclipse than a solar eclipse, even though both occur almost equally often. Because the Moon is much smaller than Earth, the Moon's full shadow, or umbra, traces only a narrow path of totality. As a result, very few people are in the right place to see any particular total solar eclipse. On average, a given location will have a total solar eclipse only about once every 375 years, though there is great variation from place to place. For example, a small region just south of St. Louis, Missouri, will have two total solar eclipses in just seven years, the one of August 21st, 2017, and another on April 8th, 2024. Near the other extreme, Los Angeles last had a total eclipse in 1724, and will not have another until the year 3290. In contrast, the entire Moon fits within Earth's full shadow, so a lunar eclipse can be observed by anyone who can see the Moon in the sky when it occurs. As you can see here, that means anyone on Earth's night side. In other words, about half the planet can see any particular lunar eclipse, but only a small region can see a particular solar eclipse. Now that you know the two basic types of eclipse, our next step is to understand when eclipses occur. To do that, we must first review why we see phases of the Moon. An easy way to understand moon phases is to take a ball outside on a sunny day. Pretend the ball is the moon and your head is the earth, and move your moon ball around you like the real moon orbits earth. This painting shows the ball, or moon, as it would appear in eight different positions as it moves around you. Notice that no matter where the moon is located, the half facing the sun is sunlit while the other half is dark. However, from your viewpoint in the middle, you'll see different portions of the sunlit and dark halves at different positions. That is why we see phases of the Moon. For example, when the Moon is here, only the dark half faces toward us, and we cannot see it at all because it is located in the same general direction in the sky as the Sun. We call this a new Moon, a name that comes from ancient beliefs that the Moon was being remade at this time. When the Moon is here, the side that faces us is half sunlit and half dark. We therefore see what looks like a half moon, but this phase is officially called first quarter because we see it when the moon is one quarter of the way around its orbit. You can understand all the phases the same way, but the other key phase for eclipses is full moon, which we see when the moon is on the side of Earth opposite the sun. It's also worth noting that the moon's full cycle of phases, from new to full and back again, takes about 29 and a half days, which is the origin of the time period we call a month which would be better called a month. We now switch to a view looking down on the Moon's orbit around Earth, showing the full shadows that each world casts into space. Notice that the Moon's shadow can touch Earth only when it is here, at the new Moon position. In other words, a solar eclipse can occur only at new Moon. Resuming the animation, we see that Earth's shadow can fall on the Moon, creating a lunar eclipse, only here, when it is full Moon. Let's now back away until we are looking down from high above our solar system so that we can see the Moon orbiting Earth while Earth orbits the Sun. 
From this viewpoint, it might look as though we should have eclipses with every new and full moon. But we don't, and the reason is that the moon's orbit around Earth is slightly tilted to the Earth's orbit around the Sun. To see the idea, let's focus on the moon's orbit in one place. This animation tilts our view so that we can see the tilt of the moon's orbit. The tilt is only about 5 degrees, but it means that the moon spends most of its orbit either slightly above or below Earth's orbital plane, crossing through this plane in two places that we call the nodes of the moon's orbit. Notice that this particular orientation cannot produce eclipses because the moon's shadow falls below Earth at new moon, and the moon is above Earth's shadow at full moon. A good way to visualize the three-dimensional nature of these orbits is to imagine Earth's orbit on the surface of a pond so that the moon's orbit crosses through the surface. Here, we show the moon's orbit in four different positions over the course of a year. Now, the nodes are the points at which the moon splashes into or out of the water on each orbit. And if you connect them with a line, you'll see that this line keeps approximately the same orientation throughout the year. Notice that there are only two time periods each year during which the nodes line up close enough with Earth and the Sun to make eclipses possible. These periods, called eclipse seasons, each last a little less than five weeks, which is enough time for both a lunar eclipse at full moon and a solar eclipse at new moon. If this were the end of the story, eclipse prediction would be easy. We'd have eclipse seasons exactly twice a year, each with a solar eclipse at new moon and lunar eclipse at full moon. Eclipse prediction is more difficult because of several complexities. First, while the diagram may make it look like eclipse seasons should come exactly six months apart, they actually come slightly more often, about 173 days apart. This is because the nodes don't stay perfectly fixed in the moon's orbit. Instead, they move around much as shown here, but far more slowly. The combination of the 173-day period between eclipse seasons and the moon's 29 and a half day cycle of phases makes eclipses recur in a pattern that repeats about every 18 years, 11 and 1 third days, a time period called the Saros cycle. Many ancient cultures kept records of eclipses that enabled them to discover the Saros cycle and thereby to predict when eclipses would occur. You can see the idea on this map which shows the paths of totality for total solar eclipses from 2017 to 2040 with paths of the same color representing eclipses separated by the Saros period. Notice that these paths, such as the ones for 2017 and 2035, also move about one-third of the way around the world, a direct result of the one-third day in the Saros cycle. This fact helps explain why ancient cultures had difficulty predicting the precise locations of eclipses, even when they could predict the timing. Precise eclipse prediction is further complicated by orbital details, such as the fact that the moon's orbital distance varies over its orbit, as shown here, and the fact that eclipses don't always come right in the middle of an eclipse season. As a result, most eclipses are not total. Instead, solar and lunar eclipses can each take three general forms. You already know that a total solar eclipse occurs when the moon's full shadow touches Earth's surface. Sometimes, however, a solar eclipse occurs at a time when the moon is relatively far from Earth in its orbit. In that case, we get what is called an annular eclipse, in which the full shadow does not quite reach Earth. The moon therefore cannot fully block the sun, even at mid-eclipse, which leaves a ring of sunlight, sometimes called a ring of fire, visible around the moon. In other cases, the full shadow may pass above or below the Earth, in which case we have only a partial solar eclipse, with no totality, or annularity. Similarly, you already know that a total lunar eclipse occurs when the moon passes through Earth's full shadow. Sometimes, however, the moon may pass partly through Earth's full shadow so that we see only a partial lunar eclipse. Other times, the moon may pass only through Earth's partial shadow or penumbra, creating what we call a penumbral lunar eclipse. A penumbral eclipse is barely noticeable to the eye. Finally, it's worth remembering that we see spectacular total solar eclipses only because the moon is just the right size and distance from Earth. If the moon were farther away, it would never be able to cover the sun completely. If it were closer, it would block the sun's atmosphere as well as its surface, so we'd never see the beautiful corona. Astronomically speaking, the moon's just right size and distance is an amazing coincidence because the moon has been gradually moving farther from Earth since the time it first formed. 
Many millions of years ago, when the moon was closer, it did cover the sun's atmosphere during eclipses. And about a billion years from now, the moon will have moved far enough away that total solar eclipses will no longer occur. That completes our introduction to eclipses. If you'd like to learn more about eclipses, or astronomy in general, you can consult my textbook series, which is the source of the animations and much of the artwork in this video. I hope you have found this video useful and welcome your comments. If you'd like to support the creation of these free videos, please look for my books from Big Kids Science and consider making a tax-deductible donation to the nonprofit Storytime from Space program, which sends books and science demonstrations to the International Space Station, where astronauts video themselves reading and demoing with the videos posted freely for anyone to use.